I'm Dan Slater, director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And really, it's a great personal and professional pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Tyrell Habercorn uh, here today from University of, of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, her talk today will be on impunity as state formation, dictatorship, and the future of justice in Thailand. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Habercorn is a professor, associate professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, previously, she, was, she taught at Australian National University, and that was after getting her PhD at Cornell. And a real virtue, I think one of the great things about Tyrell's work, which will become evident from her talk, is that it's pretty much impossible to figure out whether she's a historian, or an anthropologist, or a sociologist, or a political scientist who does comparative politics, or a political scientist who does political theory. She brings it all. She's got all of the, all of the tools. She, and so no matter what perspective you take on, uh, on questions of politics, questions of human rights, um, she just does really, really wonderful work that just is interdisciplinary in all the best ways. And so it's really, really great to have her have her here. Um, a bit more about, about her. So she's uh, written two main books from uh, University of Wisconsin Press. Uh, in 2011, she wrote a book called Revolution Interrupted, Farmers, Students, Law, and Violence in Northern Thailand. And more recently, and I think of more immediate relevance for our topic uh, today, uh, in 2018, uh, which is now last year, uh, she published In Plain Sight, Impunity and Human Rights in Thailand. Uh, I also just uh, should note by way of advertisement that Professor Habercorn will also be participating tomorrow on a panel that's being held for the Center of Southeast Asian Studies, which our own Alan Hicken will be moderating, and that is on uh, perspectives on the state of journalism. And in addition to uh, Professor Habercorn, we'll also have experts speaking on the Philippines and Myanmar. So that's from 3 to 5 tomorrow in this room. So without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Tyrell Habercorn to University of Michigan. Thank you for such a nice introduction. Um, and I should note, I, I should say the interdisciplinarity I've sometimes found in looking for a job, it's not always a plus. Um, a lot of universities talk about wanting to be interdisciplinary when they're faced with an actually interdisciplinary scholar. Sometimes it's a little more difficult, but um, I have just added, I'm teaching literature this semester. Um, so it feels like a new, a new world, although I should say it's really more like political sociology and history via literature. But um, so uh, let me begin by after finding a place to put my watch, um, by describing the problem at hand that I want to talk about. The National Council for Peace and Order, or the NCPO, and I'll use the acronym a lot, is a military junta that took power on the 22nd of May, 2014 in Thailand, in the 12th coup since the end of the absolute monarchy in June 1932. The regime of the NCPO is the most repressive one since the counterinsurgent regimes of the 1970s. But with elections now firmly scheduled for the end of next month, just two months before the five-year anniversary of the coup, a possible transition is also on the horizon. So the question that I've been thinking about a lot over the past year is if, when, and how is the NCPO going to leave power? what's going to happen to the experiences of those who have suffered under the regime? Will and how might the NCPO be held to account for its repressive actions? And then also uh, questions in a, in a somewhat different register. Given the long history of coups and dictatorship, what does the regime of the NCPO mean in terms of the history for impunity for state violence in Thailand? And resonantly, how did this history function as a key condition of possibility for the emergence of the NCPO? The context of these questions and my identification of them as a problem is born of both academic and activist work. The coup took place a little over a month after I finished the research for, um, for In Plain Sight, the book about the history of impunity. And then since the coup, I've spent a lot of time either in courtrooms observing trials of dissidents, in prison visiting those prosecuted by the NCPO, or working with colleagues to either translate materials or work on analysis of rights violations. Witnessing repression lends one kind of urgency to considering how 
the dictatorship might be held to account, and reflection on the series of events which have naturalized it over the past 80 years lends another. So in the remaining time, in order to think about how the NCPO, a regime in power, might one day be held to account, so in a sense, a call for transitional justice before, and a plan for transitional justice before a transition is certain, I'll proceed as follows. First, I'll outline an analytic approach to the Thai state to frame the urgency and imagination of accountability within a long history of impunity. Second, I'll offer a snapshot of the last four and a half plus years um, of the NCPO, with particular reference to how the use, abuse, misuse, um, and malformation of the law has been central to this junta's rule. Third, I'll offer a proposal for how the NCPO could be held to account, and in particular, through what structure um, the crimes of the NCPO might be recognized, enumerated, described, and understood. And then finally, I'll conclude by addressing the question perhaps already forming in your mind, but that will definitely arise after I talk about the long history of lack of accountability for state violence in Thailand, which is the question of feasibility and likelihood. Is this at all possible, or is it born of hopeless delusion? And if it is, is it still worth thinking about? I'll give you a hint. I think it is, but we can talk about whether that's, that's really true. Um, so to begin, uh, just over a year ago, um, my history of impunity was published as In Plain Sight. Uh, and I, I should note, I feel like I should apologize. The book was published in hardcover first. It's really expensive. It'll be out in a very inexpensive paperback version later this year. Until then, I would say borrow those of friends or find other ways to obtain it. It's, I feel very embarrassed about the cost. Um, so the book is a new history of modern Thailand, post-1932 Thailand, written through the lens of impunity, by which I mean the persistent and repeated failure to secure accountability for state violence. And in the book, beginning with the end of the absolute monarchy in 1932 and continuing through to the first year, year and a half of the 2014 coup, I trace how impunity has been produced by means of the intimidation of citizens, weak institutional structures, um, the unwillingness of state officials to hold their colleagues to account, and the unquestionable and shadowy presence of the institution of the monarchy in the polity. The systematic suppression of critical ideas that questioned the monarchy and other institutions of authority by citizens in Thailand, and the constant um, prevention of holding state officials to account for violent actions perpetrated against citizens are twin, um, twin processes that together generate impunity. One of the key arguments of the book is that impunity itself is a constituent part of state formation and nation building. Impunity often seems to be contingent at the moment that it takes place, at the moment at which police officers get away with disappearing someone, or at the moment when military officials are somehow not prosecuted either in criminal or military court for torture, um, but its effects over time are not. Each time a state official is exonerated or simply not prosecuted, sometimes um, that's the form that exoneration takes, for arbitrarily detaining, torturing, murdering, or disappearing a citizen, it becomes easier for it to happen again. Over time, this kind of injustice has come to structure relationships between state officials and citizens. So to put the argument in other words, rather than the monopoly on legitimate violence being the defining characteristic of the state, the exercise, repetition, and lack of accountability for illegitimate violence is the defining characteristic of the state. By arguing that state formation is accomplished through the production of impunity, I'm proposing a different way of understanding the state, which argues that extrajudicial violence and also those forms of violence that are provided with a gloss of legality through executive orders, court decisions, and other legal instruments, but which remain illegitimate uses of violence, as well as violations of human rights, are the actions by which the state is formed and secures compliance from its citizens. So unlike some models of the Thai state, such as the bureaucratic polity, the network monarchy, and the deep state, 
by proposing that impunity is a form of state formation rather than offering an analysis of key actors or institutions, I'm working to shift attention to how those key actors and institutions are formed, and in particular, how they're formed through the action of visiting violence upon the people. The reason why securing accountability remains difficult, if not impossible, is because perpetrators aim individually to avoid punishment, but also because the patterns of abuse and impunity are essential to maintaining the power of the institutions of which they're a part. So they're essential to maintaining the police, um, the military, and the judiciary. So in other words, the illegitimate use of violence and the subsequent securing of impunity for it are not the ways in which state officials or institutions express their power, but the very means by which they secure power. To turn to the NCPO and what this has looked like over the last four and a half years, Law and the judicial system are the primary tools by which civilians have been dispossessed of their rights. Legal privileges have been extended to military officers, including quite often military officers with zero legal training, um, and impunity for the coup, as well as all of the rights violations that have taken place since then have been guaranteed. Um, uniquely, um, in, in, or intriguingly in this context, the NCPO initially um, claimed that part of the reason why they had to launch a coup um, was because after 10 years of street protests and contention in Thai society, um, there was a need to restore the rule of law. Instead of restoring the rule of law, however, I'd argue that we should look at this as a regime that has consistently and fundamentally undermined the rule of law. Um, and in this sense, they're quite resonant with a number of authoritarian um, regimes that have opted for a rule by law regime to secure, secure authority and attempt to make themselves uh, look good at the same time. So for example, martial law, which provided authorities with broad powers of suppression, was enforced for the first 10 months after the coup. It was um, discontinued after the first 10 months, largely I think due to both domestic and international criticism, but um, a number of other junta orders have basically maintained the same uh, illegal um, or anti-legal powers. So one of the things that has taken place is that until, in addition, is that um, until September of 2016, Civilian cases against the Crown or state were placed within the military court system, and I'm happy to talk further about what that looks like in the Q&A. Um, since September 2016, no new cases have been initiated, but any old cases remain. Um, and according to Thai Lawyers for Human Rights, or TLHR, which is a legal and advocacy organization established to defend those targeted by the NCPO, a total of 2,408 civilians in a total of 1,892 cases um, are being prosecuted in the military court system. I wanna make a note about all of the numbers that, that I'll use, which is that these are at least numbers. These are the numbers that activists and journalists and lawyers know about. Um, the junta has consistently refused to release their own details of how many people have been accused of various laws, how many people have been prosecuted. So, um, so it's likely that the numbers are actually, actually higher. In addition to the use of the military court system, existing criminal law, particularly measures related to expression of opinion and political demonstration, have been used to both target individual dissidents and also create a climate of fear in which others are afraid to speak out. So for example, Article 112, the measure of the criminal code that describes and stipulates the punishment for less majesty, um, has been used against civilians who dare to publicly question the king or institution of the monarchy. Since the NCPO has been in power, at least 162 individuals have been prosecuted. Innocent verdicts are incredibly rare, bail is incredibly rare, and sentences have reached 30 to 35 years. A lot of these cases have involved social media, and the, the, general, um, the general rate is five years per Facebook post. And that's if you confess. If you don't, it would be 10 years per post. Article 116, the measure of the criminal code regarding sedition, has instead been used against activists who criticize the NCPO, with at least 92 cases initiated since the coup. 
both um, NCPO orders criminalizing a public assembly of five or more persons, which actually that was just revoked late last year. Um, but never fear, the 2015 Public Assembly Act still gives the police and military a strong tool to, um, to suppress people who are protesting who they wish would not protest. But these laws have been used to bring charges against both individual protesters and also organizers of protests with at least 378 cases initiated since the coup. Something to note about both 116, the sedition law, and also the public assembly cases is that unlike Article 112 cases where prosecutions and sentences are typically handed out really swiftly, these other cases have moved very slowly. Um, some people who actually were accused in 2014, their cases are still not done. Instead, they have to appear at the court every month, every two months, and so they operate as a life interruption and a form of judicial harassment. In addition to the use of existing law, the NCPO has also promulgated 528 executive orders that are legal, binding, and constitutional that authorize arbitrary detention, re-education, land and property seizure, and other rights violations. These will not automatically go away once the junta leaves power. They would need to be individually or en masse revoked. Um, until then, they'll continue to operate as law. Human rights violations, including assault, torture, disappearance, death, or the threat of any of these things against oneself or one's family members, have typically taken place during the processes of arrest, um, investigation, and prosecution. So in other words, extrajudicial violence has taken place in concert with the exercise of the law, rather than being prevented by it or being used in lieu of it as dictatorships in Thailand in earlier periods have chosen. So in sum, after four years in power, the NCPO has entrenched itself um, as a regime in which dissent is criminalized, the military is unquestionable, and the monarchy is placed even further outside of questioning. Given this entrenchment, how might the NCPO be unseated? How might the legal tables be turned? So to come to the concrete proposal, um, of how and with what structure the crimes of the NCPO might be enumerated, described, and understood. I'm drawing on a proposal that a colleague and I wrote in collaboration with Thai Lawyers for Human Rights, or TLHR. So let me pause to say a little bit more about TLHR. Um, TLHR is a network of now, uh, I think their staff is close to 30, um, lawyers and documentation specialists, but it was founded on the second night after the coup to provide legal advice to the journalists, academics, and civil society activists who were summoned to report for arbitrary detention and attitude adjustment by the NCPO. Since then, TLHR and other Thai human rights groups have carried out expert victim-centered documentation that often includes dates of arrest, length of detention, and other known details, and if applicable, the details and progress of criminal charges levied and prosecuted against someone. As I noted earlier, the NCPO has consistently refused to release any information about those it targets, even basic information about the number of arrests and prosecutions. So the detailed files kept by TLHR and others powerfully counters the junta's denial by omission. Um, TLHR and then also other Thai and international human rights organizations have used this information about the NCPO's victims to produce urgent appeals in pending cases, reports highlighting specific kinds of criminal charges levied against individuals such as Les Majest and criminalization of freedom of expression, as well as annual reports describing the broad picture of repression. This work as well as complementary um, reporting and essays by journalists and scholars has functioned to keep the junta's victims from disappearing from view at the moment at which they're being targeted and are therefore vulnerable. Looking towards the beginning of the end of the NCPO's regime and hopefully a transition out of dictatorship, the project that we're working on aims to instead name and make visible what might be viewed as the opposite group, the perpetrators of rights violations. 
Dictatorships attempt to make their victims invisible to deny their humanity, while impunity means that perpetrators often remain unnamed and their violent and coercive actions are not classed as crimes. So for example, under dictatorship, General Prayut Chan Ocha is the prime minister, not a rogue army general who has presided over close to five years of state repression. Under dictatorship, a military officer who tortures a person accused of being a dissident is protecting his nation, not committing the crime of assault. Under dictatorship, a private stand, who stands outside guarding the door while the torture takes place is following his commanding officer's orders, not being an accessory to the crime of assault. But after dictatorship, these actions and the culpability of those who committed them can be evaluated again. And one only has to look, for example, at the Southern Cone and the, the shift that over time, the actions um, that, that were allegedly taken to protect, to protect a nation, to protect the security of the state, come to be seen very differently through a much different lens. The NCPO's reliance on the law as their primary tool of repression and even the structure within which most extrajudicial violence takes place means that a partial record of perpetrators, the context of their actions, and also in some cases, accounts of their actions already exist in arrest records, police interrogation transcripts, and court documents. So the idea of this project is to use the extensive files of state documents collected by TLHR and other rights advocates to defend the victims and to read them against the grain to discover a different possible catalog of crimes and perpetrators. TLHR's body of documentation is organized in parallel to their legal advocacy, so it includes records relating to the 303 individuals they're defending in 151 cases. In each of these cases, they have copies of all of the available police documents, which include arrest and interrogation records, court documents, which include orders, testimony, declarations to the court, decisions and appeals, and my favorite category, ephemeral documents. Um, in addition, TLHR has extensive records of rights violations that, that never reached the court. Um, so assault, torture, surveillance, favorite tool of the NCPO, um, so much so that every talk I've been to or given in, especially I would say the last three years, begins with people greeting the Santiban or intelligence officers in the room, because you can pick them out easily enough, so why not say, glad you've come to listen again. Please pay attention rather than playing with your phone. Um, they still play with their phone. Um, but. But so this extraordinary and vast collection of primary documents both inspired this project and also will form the basis of the, of the research. So in a sense, um, similar to the lawyers and activists who use the Brazilian military court documents produced by the dictatorship in power between 1964 and 1985 to legitimize the imprisonment of their critics, to instead um, write Brazil Never Again, which is a catalog of the torture methods used by the military. The idea is to use the investigation and judicial documents of those prosecuted by the NCPO against the NCPO. Um, so rather than searching for evidence to use to argue the victim's innocence, the project aims to identify evidence of violation, by the, by violation of the law by state officials, the arbitrary and disproportionate exercise of the law, and also inconsistencies and departures from the law. Then, using the four bodies of law relevant in Thailand as a guide, so the Criminal Code, the Criminal Procedure Code, the 2007 Constitution, and the International Human Rights Conventions to which Thailand is a state party, the project will create an overview of how violations of the law and damage to the rule of law rather than its restoration have characterized the government of the NCPO. So, for example, this looks, uh, this means looking at how state officials violated laws that comprise the criminal code, such as assault. How they disregarded the criminal procedure code. So for example, when they waited several days to actually request a detention order for someone who was already in detention. Um, 
or disregarded the broader principles of human rights that are embodied in the 2017 Constitution and in Thailand's international human rights obligations. Thailand is a signatory to almost every, um, every major human rights instrument. Um, and so it's, it's, not a, it's not a stretch. It's, not a, or, it's a stretch in some ways, but not a complete stretch. So let me offer three examples of what this might look like. So the first is a torture case. Thai military um, police and prison officials frequently use torture to extract information, compel confessions, and intimidate or threaten those who they have decided are their enemies. Um, one of the contexts in which this often happens is within arbitrary detention. So in southern Thailand, since the declaration of martial law in 2004, um, people can be held for up to seven days in what, is, what are referred to as non-standard places of detention. What this means is not a police station, not a prison. Um, in practice, it often means rooms in army bases um, or other, any place can be designated a temporary place of detention. Um, what those who work in southern Thailand have found is that over um, the past 15 years is that torture very frequently happens in those contexts um, because people don't have access to lawyers, they don't have access to their families, and they often don't have access to anyone else around them. After the coup, um, first under martial law and then under junta order, which is still in place, seven days of arbitrary detention um, in undisclosed non-usual places of detention is also possible. Um, in addition um, to, to not, uh, not having access to a lawyer, those first seven days of detention, one, isn't, one doesn't actually even exist as a suspect within the judicial system, so there's, there's truly little, little recourse. Um, the person whose image you see, San Sun Si Un Ruan, is a 62-year-old taxi driver who was arrested on the 9th of March 2019 and accused of being part of a group of people who carried out a bombing, a very small bombing, in front of the criminal court building two days prior on the 7th of March. He and three other men were held in military detention between the 9th and 15th of March before being transferred to police custody. Once he was transferred to police custody and able to meet with his lawyers from TLHR, he told them that, quote, soldiers punched and kicked him in his ribs, chest, and head, applied electric shocks to his upper right thigh, and issued death threats. He was stripped naked and humiliated during the interrogation, unquote. Sansern and TLHR made this report of his torture public, including releasing photographs of the burn marks caused by electrocution on his legs and demanded an official investigation. The police did carry out an investigation, but they declined to meet with either Sansern or his lawyers. They concluded that the reason for the bruises on his chest could not be determined and, quote, might have been caused by impact or by falling onto some blunt object, unquote, and that his allegations were, quote, unfounded, unquote. Um, they didn't mention the electrocution at all, just not mentioned in the report. So torture is not currently defined as a crime within the Thai criminal code, but assault is. Um, and Thailand is a state party to both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the Convention Against Torture. And I'll just note that as part of Thailand's obligations um, as a state party to the Convention on Torture, they are required to draft domestic law um, preventing torture. A law was drafted and completed and entering the review process right before the coup. As you might not be surprised, it has been stalled over the last four and a half years. The military junta has not been interested in passing an anti-torture law. Maybe one day it will pass. The law is quite, it's quite nice. Uh, it's it's a, good, a good piece of legislation. Um, it's reasonable to expect that there are Many others who had similar experiences to Sansern, um, but who have chosen not to speak out at this point. Um, I would suggest that when there is a transition, a careful accounting of torture cases and exactly what happened to people during those days of arbitrary detention before they entered the, the judicial system will be a necessary part of um, ensuring state accountability for the coup. 
So second, a, a death in custody, or I, I would flag it as a death in custody that was maybe a murder case. Um, on the 16th of October, 2015, um, Suri Yan, Suturit Ponwong, and Rakom Warun Papa were arrested and held in uh, incommunicado detention under junta order. Five days later, the three men who were thought to be close to then crown prince, now king, uh, Longkon, were accused of les majest publicly and sent by the military court to be remanded at a temporary remand facility on a military base in Bangkok. Three days later, on the 24th of October, there were news reports that Brakram had committed suicide by hanging the day before. No autopsy was carried out, even though the criminal procedure code stipulates that anybody who dies in state custody has to have an autopsy performed on them. To give you an example of how this is act truly and actually followed, um, in, there was a case of an imam who was tortured to death in southern Thailand in 2008. Um, and tortured to death by the army officials who held him in custody. Even in his case, an autopsy was carried out. I mean, it's, it's in the criminal procedure code, even when state officials uh, are likely to come out not looking good, it is generally followed. Um, his family chose to cremate his body the very next day. Then, two weeks later, on the 7th of November, the Minister of Justice announced that Suryan, a famous fortune teller, also known as Ma Yong, had died in custody. The Minister of Justice claimed that an autopsy had been carried out by the Institute of Forensic Medicine and found that the cause of death was, quote, respiratory and blood circulation failures due to blood infection, unquote. As in the other case, Suryan's family cremated his body the next day. The question which remains is whether or not the statements by authorities correspond to what actually took place, or if the swift cremations after these two deaths in custody indicate that another explanation is possible. Deaths in custody and how they're dealt with are a key indicator of how a government treats human rights. This is the case for Thailand, the United States, anywhere. It's always worth paying attention to. Um, so these two cases raise a very large question. Um, if, I would argue that after a transition, if evidence is found of murder or other foul play by the authorities, then those responsible should be prosecuted under relevant criminal law. So the third is a case of restriction of freedom of expression. Um, Unlike the, the first two cases, the violation of the rights of Datupat Bunpatraraksa, or Pai, a recent law graduate, he took his last law school exam in prison, um, from Konken University, can less easily be tied to a specific provision of criminal law. Pai, a longtime human rights, environmental, um, and student activist, is undergoing prosecution for four cases of peaceful protest of the junta while serving a two and a half year sentence for alleged violation of Article 112, stemming from having shared a BBC Thai news article about King Mahawajira Longkon to Facebook. Although over 2,600 people shared the same article, Pai is the only one who has been prosecuted. He was arrested on the 2nd of December 2016, only a few days after the new king was announced. Um, although all cases of Article 112 are a restriction of freedom of expression, I would suggest this case is worth our attention because it's a very clear, selective application of the law to target um, an established critic of the, of the junta. It also, I think, has functioned very effectively to send the message to other activists that, one, we are paying attention to, but also will use this very potent tool um, in, our, in our hands, Article 112, to target you if we, so, if we so choose to do so. So in that sense, I think his prosecution um, has, a ve has had a very chilling effect. Other citizens don't know if or when they might face similar treatment. I include this, this example precisely because it's so hard to think about how it might be addressed following a transition. Um, 
it's very unclear how, what might one do to stop it, both sort of stop the actual practice, but also the legacies. Um, so for example, the 2017 Junta authored constitution, it's a funny document. It offers, uh, it guarantees freedom of expression, but with the usual exceptions for ma matters of national security, including the monarchy. So I'm not sure what we should do about Article 112. I leave it out there as, a, as an open question. So stepping back from these three examples, some of the questions to ask across all of the cases over the last four and a half years to comprehend the crimes of the NCPO might include, are there, so the first would be, are there patterns, changes, and continuity across the span of the dictatorship and with respect to gender, political affiliation, geography, age, and class of victims? And I, I would also stop and say that I think this is one of the places where where scholars and other researchers have a useful role to play for activists who are working day to day, stepping back in the moment to try to see what patterns might be just isn't possible because the phone often rings with someone else who has just been arrested. So those of us who have, in a relative sense, leisure on our hands, this is one way that we can, that we can be useful. Um, a second key question is what is the relationship between law and extrajudicial violence? So how and when do threats of torture disappearance and death and the actual uh, actions themselves emerge in relation to official arrest and prosecution, and when do they not? Um, third, are there clear patterns of specific police and military units involved in the perpetration of human rights violations? And also, are there patterns of judges who are involved in making legal decisions that foreclose rather than facilitate civilian access to justice? In thinking about these questions, our hope um, is to analyze how the law has been broken and human rights violated by the NCPO, and also to offer a very, very rough draft of what might go into an eventual indictment. So I wanna begin to conclude by commenting on the question of feasibility, and in so doing, return to the question of the writing of the history of impunity, or perhaps its opposite, the possibility of a future of accountability. So as I noted at the beginning of the talk, the 22 May 2014 coup was the 12th coup um, that was successful, meaning that the junta succeeded in seizing the ruling power of the country since the end of the absolute monarchy in 1932. 11 of the 29 prime ministers to hold office in those 80 plus years have come to power through launching a military coup or being appointed by a junta. Um, the current constitution, uh, is the country's 20th. It's a lot of constitutions. Thai politics are caught in what Tanapon Yusagun, a public intellectual, describes as a sinister cycle of coup constitution election. As soon as democracy and people's participation begins to return to the polity, the military halts progress with another coup and the cycle begins again. Significantly, Despite the end of the absolute monarchy in 1932, the king and the institution of the monarchy remain closely connected to the military and remain unnamed actors in the cycle and in the polity. The king is neither constrained by the constitution nor outside politics, and this is true across regimes both dictatorial and democratic. Um, Article 112 means that civilians are severely restricted from questioning, let alone criticizing, the king or institution of the monarchy. In addition, a series of very well-crafted amnesty laws and provisions mean that no military or other state official involved in a successful coup has faced prosecution or otherwise been held to account either for launching a coup or rights violations that have happened subsequently. The sinister cycle and the impunity that guarantees its continuity are both symptom and cause of the long-term fragility of the rule of law in Thailand. And this fragility um, is part of a process in which Tong Chai Winichigun argues that a universal language of law, human rights, and justice is used, but to reflect and reinforce hierarchical and unequal relations between the rulers and the ruled, rather than challenging them. This fragility didn't originate with the NCPO, but I would argue that the range of human rights abuses committed in the name of restoring the rule of law and the length of the junta's regime as the second longest running dictatorship since 1932 foreshadow a new level of decline. Um, and the longer they're in power, I think the, the more 
clear this is. That said, the NCPO is not impervious to domestic and international calls for democratization, and elections do seem to be truly scheduled for March 24th. Of course, no matter what happens, the 2017 Constitution provides for a continued role of the military in politics for at least five years, if not longer, following the election. Um, these constraints and the long history of evasion of accountability for state violence may seem to indicate that despite elections and a partial transition, the sinister cycle is unlikely to be broken and the possibility that the rule of law in Thailand will continue to be out of reach. But um, I want to suggest that somewhat tentatively, um, because I worry that I'm too hopeful, that a constellation of domestic and international factors suggests that present conditions for breaking the sinister cycle, fostering accountability, and seeing the rule of law emerge are the strongest um, in the last 80 years of Thai history. Internationally, there has been what Catherine Sicking calls a global justice cascade between 1970 and 2010, in which amnesties have been overturned and criminal prosecution for those involved in dictatorship has been possible. To date, Asia has been the region most resistant to the justice cascade, and Thailand has been no exception. But a minority of judges have expressed concern about the rule of law and accountability during the last five years, even under the NCPO, as opposed to previous indifference. So to offer two examples of this new consciousness, First, shortly after the coup, resistant citizen, a group of civil society activists filed a criminal complaint of rebellion and treason against General Prayut Chan Osha and the NCPO for carrying out the coup. All three courts, the Court of First Instance, the Appeal Court, and the Supreme Court dismissed the complaint. The basis of the dismissal was that the amnesty provided um, for the coup in the interim 2014 constitution and confirmed in the 2017 constitution were existing law, therefore, as courts, they could only dismiss the case. But several sentences in the Supreme Court judgment about the junta, which was issued in June 2018, invite re-examination following a junta, following a transition. They note that regarding the NCPO's authority, quote, even though as the 15 plaintiffs resistant citizen have claimed that authority was secured in a manner not in accordance with democracy. Other aspects of whether or not that power was legitimately obtained must be discussed, unquote. It was an incredibly hard two sentences to translate because they are very, very unclear um, because they don't say what the other aspects were or where they must be discussed. But um, it made me very, very uh, excited. I think these sentences reflect a willingness to reconsider the legality and broader justness of launching a coup, even when it's successful. Second, within the judiciary, there's concern about adherence to Thailand's international human rights obligations. In mid-July, I observed defense witnesses in the Konkan military court in one of Pai Datupat's freedom of expression cases. The defense lawyers called a noted law professor to give testimony on freedom of expression in other countries and on Thailand's obligations as a state party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which Thailand ratified in 96. The military judge, who I made the comment earlier that a lot of those involved in military, in the military judiciary are not, they don't have legal training. This particular judge, person sitting as a judge, did not have legal training. And he asked a great many clarifying questions. The prosecutor um, attempted to stop him, but, but he, he continued. The judge had never heard of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and wanted to know what was in it and what did it mean for Thailand to be a state party. He could have been disinterested. He could have actually ended the testimony and said this is irrelevant to the case and what took place. Um, but his actions suggest, not only his actions, but also that the answers to those questions were entered into the court record for the day, indicate that the conventions matter, even for those dressed in the green of the military. I am aware that of the possible criticism that despite these encouraging signs, small encouraging signs, and the possible supportive context for the emergence of a justice cascade in Thailand, I am incorrect, and the sinister cycle of coup, constitution, election, 
guaranteed by impunity will continue. However, I maintain that even if I am completely wrong and holding the NCPO to account in the near future is impossible, imagining how the NCPO's crimes might be enumerated and how accountability might be sought can contribute to both comparative scholarship and the long-term, truly long-term processes of challenging impunity and strengthening the rule of law in Thailand resonant with the rewriting of court decisions to reflect gender equality by feminist legal scholars in India, Canada, and the UK, the work of analyzing the NCPO's actions and outlining how their effects might be redressed is a form of scholarship that both criticizes the repression enacted in the name of the law and specifies what justice might look like. So in other words, similar to visionary Chicana lesbian feminist Gloria Anzaldúa's assertion that nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads, a key step towards ending impunity is taking seriously the possibility of accountability and then actually preparing for it. Um, and that means doing the careful work of sifting through what took place, what are all the ways in which it was wrong, and, and what, might we, what might we do. I will end there. Thank you. We have about half an hour for our questions. So is there a friendly microphone? So um yeah, hunters have been known to not give up power willingly. I, my question would be, what would it take to disseminate power in, in Thailand so that structurally it could weaken the situation on a national level that the junta would, would um, lose its, its power? What would, it, what would be the uh, democratic steps be to put power back on, let's say, a local level or into the citizens, or citizenry? Um, I think it will be very difficult. I think the, the, first, the first thing that needs to happen is the 24 March elections need to take place. They need to take place in a context in which um, the votes are respected uh, and, and the outcome is respected. Then, uh, and there are a lot of ifs in this process, then I think there probably needs to be an amendment to the 2017 constitution that provides, to give you an idea of some of the ways in which the junta will still have power. Um, there are six seats, there are six parliamentary seats uh, reserved for, for them. They also have the authority to um, appoint an external prime minister if, if they don't like the one who is elected. Um, I think without the, in thinking long term without, without actually changing the, the process by which those who are drafting the laws and administering the country, it will be very difficult to recreate and then strengthen uh, citizen participation. There, there are then longer beyond the, that sort of immediate task. Um, the military needs to, the, the power and authority of the military needs to be significantly reduced. Um, there need to be, it needs to be not thinkable on the part of the military when we start thinking about sort of what people imagine in their heads. I sometimes wonder, you know, how do we get to a point where military officers stop being able to think, okay, I'm going to get together with some of my colleagues and we're going to plan how we snatch the snatch the government from the, elected, from the elected figures. That needs to become unthinkable. Um, and I think the only way that becomes unthinkable is for there to be real consequences for, for doing so. Um, so in that sense, I think if, there's, if there is an attempt to hold the NCPO to account, that could offer a powerful deterrent. The final factor, um, which is the most difficult to to talk about less partially because of Article 112, but, but even more so because so little concretely is known, is that the place of the monarchy and the polity needs to, needs to be something that can be discussed and needs to become something that can be questioned. 
Uh, it has a powerful chilling effect. Even just asking, what is the precise relationship between the institution of the monarchy and the military needs to be, it needs to be a possible question. Uh, thank you for the talk, Tyrrell. Um, I'll take you up on your offer to play devil's advocate, so I'll be devil your <laughs> hopes or aspirations. Um, and I want to sort of do this a little indirectly, because you, in your talk you talked about sort of under dictatorship and after dictatorship, mm -hmm. and I want to think about before dictatorship mm -hmm. and how this complicates the vision you laid out. So, you know, you, you talk about holding current NCPO folks accountable for violating the four different codes, but of course, state actors have been violating those codes before the NCPO, right? Consistently, rather extensively, right? Um, and that goes back beyond, you know, that's more than before the 10 years of, you know, color politics and polarization and just, you know, coups and dissolution you know, government dissolutions and all that. I mean, you yourself say that impunity is hardwired into mm. the constitution of the state, right? So I just wonder about, so you just use the language of recreating or restoring, mm -hmm. right? Poli the, on, per the legal on participation. Okay, participation. Yeah. Not on but then, but, but then the question is, is we obviously can't go back to restoring and reconstituting the legal regimes before all of no. this, right? I mean, so what do you do in the face of it seems to me in order to really achieve practically what you're looking for, it's about more than just changing minds, right? There's mm -hmm. at least two dimensions which you haven't really talked about. Mm -hmm. One is, you know, you have to have sort of a vision, culture, and practice of legal accountability as an ongoing, sustained institutional reality both substantively and formally but you also need essentially mass mobilization and consciousness pushing for the for constitutional rule of law. And the prior history is not strong in either of those dimensions to a significant degree. So how do you get mm -hmm to holding them accountable if, from my perspective, you actually need those as foundations in order to, in order to get those kinds of charges and accountability. Um, yeah. So it's a great question, and actually it gives me a chance to talk about another positive sign um, that was crushed by, crushed by the coup, which is that um, in relation to, so for non, for people who don't follow Thai politics closely, in April and May of 2010, um, there were large scale protests by red shirt protesters, a very brutal military crackdown um, in which 90, at least 94 people were killed, over 2,000 were grievously injured. Um, a remarkable thing happened in late 2013, which is that the prime minister and deputy prime minister who gave the orders to the military to use lethal force were indicted in the criminal court for giving those orders. And the, the indictment was brought by the Office of the Attorney General working in, in collaboration with the victims of people who were killed. And they used investigation that the Department of Special Investigation, which is roughly analogous to the US FBI, they investigate when state officials, in particular when state officials have violated the law that they carried out. Um, the legal argument that they made in the indictment is that the, they indicted um, the former prime minister and former deputy prime minister for premeditated murder. And they linked giving the order to use lethal force when the conditions to use lethal force were not legally met as the reason why, why that could be premeditated murder. This caused, as you can imagine, a great amount of consternation for the former prime minister and the former deputy prime minister. Intriguingly, the former deputy prime minister who's currently running for election, uh, Suteb Tagsuban, made a statement to the press where actually he was talking to the press, but he was really talking to soldiers. He said, don't worry, little brother soldiers. 
I won't let this come to your door, which really means, little brother soldiers, if I go to court, I'm going to throw this on you. I mean, I think that's, I read that as what he really, what he really meant. He said, don't worry, I'll hire you the best lawyers. Um, three months after the coup, no, sorry, uh, four months after the coup, August, three months after the coup, August of 2014, the criminal court dismissed the case. And they did it with a very strange dismissal. They said, this case is not in our jurisdiction because the accused defendants held political office when these actions were carried out. Therefore, they can only be examined in the special court for holders of political office. The Office of the Attorney General and the families responded with outrage and said, we weren't accusing them of corruption or of not performing their duties as civil servants correctly. They were indicted for murder. That's not, the, the change in court is not relevant. The president of the courts of justice, who very rarely issues any kind of dissenting statements, in fact, I've only found the one, um, issued a dissenting statement that was published in the newspaper saying, this is an incorrect ruling. This was within the jurisdiction of the criminal court. Um, you know, the, it should have gone forward. It's all to say, I think another reason why this coup is so significant is that it took place at a moment when it is quite possible that the force of law might have wound up on the military's doorstep. And in particular, um, in the case of General Prayut Chanosha, he was the commander in chief of the army when, when that crackdown took place. Um, Actually, I can't remember if he was commander in chief then or if he becomes commander in chief later and he was the head of region one then. Um, but so I agree with you. There's not a long, there's not a long history of, of state officials being held to account for mass violence. For individual cases of violence, it's very, very rare, although there have been some surprising successes. But there's not a culture of accountability. But I, I don't think it's possible to wait until that comes. Again, if you look at how Things have taken place in other contexts in which former dictators have been held to account. It's part of the process of building. Um, you know, I, I hate. I actually am not a fan of using the word culture of accountability of, or culture of rules. Let's say practice. The practice of accountability. It's part of building that. Um, and in terms of activists, I think there's been a the person to read on this. Of course, is really Frank Munger, but who's traced. The shift in legal consciousness among human rights activists over several generations in Thailand since the 1970s. And there's, there's been a shift in the questions and kinds of cases that human rights lawyers in Thailand bring as well. And they're also shifting, again, sort of I think following a global shift, shifting towards some of these questions of, of broader accountability. The, very, the, the resistant citizen case is a good example of it. Um, I think this is really interesting and important work. Um, the question that I wanted to ask you was about what you think uh, the logic is of these trials and why, how that logic may be affecting why some trials are made public and others remain secret. Um, so the examples that you gave of political dissidents who are being persecuted for these crimes, it seems to, the logic seems to be a deterrent. So like the example you, that you showed of this guy being thrown in jail for that Facebook post, it's, it's a signal to other people that they should not be posting these things. So if these trials do have this you know, powerful deterrent effect, wh why do you think there are other cases which are not being, why aren't, why aren't all the trials being made public then? Wouldn't that be a more powerful deterrent um, for a range of different behaviors? So I was wondering if you could speak about that. Um, so I guess there's two, there are two kinds of, I would say there's two kinds of publicness. So one of the things that's often very unpublic is that in many cases, especially Article 112 cases, um, any of the examination is closed, completely closed to the public. And I think that's um, the official reason given by the court is always that the case examination might, um, how does it, it translates to might have negative, negative effects on the feelings and consciousness of the people. Um, but, but I think uh, often, um, 
often cases that are that are not publicly discussed, sometimes I would say sometimes it's because um, they're not seen as significant by by journalists. In many cases, it's also because people have asked not to not to have their cases reported on. I think the junta would be very happy if no one reported on any of the cases. <laughs> um, they don't, you know, one of the things that is uh, the Thai sort of the Thai police apparatus likes to do is to hold big um, after someone has been has been arrested at the police investigation stage and, and accused but often not indicted in court. The police, like if it's a drug case or a big murder case, they'll hold a press conference where basically to say like we've done a great job catching drug traffickers. None of these political cases are ever made public in that sense. Um, I think the the junta, for the most part, is trying to um, is trying to intimidate people among the relatively small circle of vocal activists. I mean, this is one of the things that is also worth noting. And um, I had a, an undergraduate student at ANU who just wrote a, a, an intriguing thesis on this on this topic: um, why there's been so little opposition to the regime. Um, I don't actually know how to explain it. I think it's a fascinating question. Um, the thesis, the thesis uh, student, her explanation, which I found intriguing. I, we argued about it, and I, but it was it was a bold argument, as she said. Basically, the junta's kind of repression, which has been this um, sort of ongoing legal legal harassment, has functioned very effectively to keep people from coming out into the streets. Because it seems to many people, incorrectly, but it seems to many people relatively harmless. So it doesn't provoke outrage. Um, I think there's more going on that I don't actually know how to how to explain. In terms of the your question about the logic, the logic behind repression is such a fascinating one. I'm not sure there is one. <laughs> um, in fact, what seems really striking is, and this is one of the reasons why. I think it will be very interesting to see what happens in in different regions of the country and literally different different you know regions under different parts of control by the army because what happens in the northeast is and how for example rural villagers working on resource rights issues how they're treated is very different from how students in Bangkok are treated or students in Patani or academics in Chiang Mai like there's really distinct forms of um, forms of action that by state authorities that to me indicate there isn't a central plan. <laughs> this is this is much more much more diffuse. So, Terrell, this is wonderful. Um, I really appreciate the talk. Um, I wonder if you can uh, help help me think through a couple of things. So, um, I, I think I agree with you about the sort of changing international environment, but I wonder if you can comment on maybe counter. Uh, Countercurrents at the international level as well. So the sort of models of impunity uh, in the region, whether it's China or the Philippines or Russia, is sort of um, more pronounced and more um, more legitimate in some ways than they have for for many have been for many decades, and how that might affect this uh, this calculation. And I wonder if you can help help me think about. So the, the, the sort of models of, of post, post-conflict, post-transition justice out there, there's a, you know these letters better than I do, there's a debate between timing, about timing, right? So mm -hmm. is it best to do it quickly um, uh, or not? And, and this, this sort of the tension between risking a backlash uh, on the part of, you know, so I, I, I can imagine a scenario where they attempt to amend the Constitution, they, 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 they file charges against the junta, and, um, and the, the tanks roll again, right? Um, so uh, the other hand, um, a blanket amnesty might be good for diffusing polarization tensions and and uh, keeping the military in the barracks. But um, you know th those those blanket amnesties lead to impunity, right? No 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 reaction, no 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 punishment for seventy six, no punishment for ninety two. Some attempts for uh, Raja Prasong, but but nothing happening yet. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, it's something I sort of struggle with. What's the you know, if we sort of think about the path out of this and the best, uh, and, the, and the path that leads to both justice and peace, um, is there a path that gets us both uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the short, medium, and, and long term? Those are great and hard questions. I'll work backwards. I think, I think this is a long, this is the long game. <laughs> um, I, 
I'm very, I, I think a lot about, like I think about the age that I am and how, like will this, will this happen before I stop doing research? I suspect not. To be super frank, I think this is, this is a 40 to 50 year project. Um, I think for that reason, it is essential to try to do some of the analysis now. And I say this because um, when I was writing In Plain Sight, I used records of a human rights group, the coordinating group on religion and society that was active after the 76 coup, sort of through the Prem regime into the late 80s. They collected incredible material. Then the group, things got better. There was a, a sort of a shift in social activist priorities. The group, they sort of, the people who worked in the group went on to do other things. They actually, they never collected their documents. Um, I pieced them together using a bunch of different libraries and private collections. Um, and and it, it just kind of faded away. <laughs> and that will happen. Actually, Al McCoy does a brilliant job of writing about this in his book on torture in the context of the US. And he says, when all of a sudden the torture scandal at Abu Ghraib breaks, Activists in the US are shocked. They can't believe this has happened. US state officials using torture in violation of US and international law. And then he says, it was the sixth time it had happened since World War II. <laughs> and I think that's what happens because there's always going to be something else happens that, that draws particularly the attention of those who are providing sort of frontline assistance. Um, so, so I want to acknowledge this is long term and, and work on it for that reason, but without any hope that this is gonna happen in the next year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. I, I don't think it's going to happen, because I think you're right. I think the, you know, I remember being very excited over the summer when new political parties were emerging, and I'm generally not that excited about political parties. I'm interested in a more grassroots group of actors, but, but some of their policies seemed so exciting and powerful. Now, looking at what's happened over, over the past months, I'll be happy if people all make it to election safely. Um, you know, when, when I talked to one politician uh, in central Thailand in, um, in January who said that his mother told him that she was worried about him being disappeared. And he kind of laughed about it, but it wasn't funny. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant concern. So. So yeah, that's, I think it's, that's long term. And this, the, your first question about what to do about the countercurrents, particularly you know, in Southeast Asia is, and sort of looming China is a, is a huge question. Um, I think you know, looking at Indonesia and what's happened and how what seemed to be a much more hopeful possibility of addressing 65, 66, even two years ago has really faded, even though now more is known about what took place than ever before. That knowledge can't be acted on because of the, the political context. And in the Philippines, that what's taking place now, I would have thought was not imaginable after Marcos, that it could be this bad. Um, I think the, I don't have a good analytic answer there other than to say, I think activists working in the region hopefully will show us the way forward. So we got time for two more questions. Okay, thanks again for the talk. It was wonderful. Um, so I think there's a way in which you treat impunity and accountability as synonyms in the mm -hmm. talk. And so obviously impunity means, you know, there's a lack of punishment and holding people accountable usually implies punishment. But I think there's a kind of richer understanding of accountability that might give us an entry point to think about how to uproot this a little bit, which is to say that accountability also implies that one has to answer to people, right? And so that there is, one does things with a certain justification in mind towards certain audiences. And so what I'm wondering is if you could speak a little bit to the politics of justification mm -hmm. um, that underlies the kind of repression that we're seeing. And I'm, I'm glad you raised the, the issue of 1965 in Indonesia because I would say in that case, one reason why the politics of you know, impunity is so entrenched is because there's a narrative of justification about, about anti-communism. So, so the communism rhetoric is coming back precisely as that politics of justification. And so it seems to me that if we really want to uproot this um, in, a, in maybe some ways a faster way, 
is to actually attack the politics of justification and show its weaknesses and show why, in fact, the repression, the coercion, the torture, the things being used, in fact, are not justifiable through the regime's own language of justification. So if you say, I you mean, you mentioned Lizzie Majesté, um, but in some ways, if you could address what, what does the politics of justification look like and what might its uh, you know, soft underbelly look like, if you will? It's a great question. Um, and this is, this is actually where the, the language of the rule of law is so significant, because that's the primary justification that the NCPO has used, putting the monarchy to the side. Because of course, that's also part of their explanation for the coup, but it's not, not really addressable in quite the same way. Their logic for the coup that they have stated over and over again is that the 10 years of contention prior had created chaos and had destroyed the rule of law and the meaning of the law. And that's why they had to launch the coup. And in a sense, that's, that's why the, the idea of the project is to prim primarily focus on the law and what they've done with it to say, you claimed you were going to restore the rule of law. Instead, you have done the exact opposite. Um, you know, there's, there's other pieces of their, there are other pieces of, the justi of, their just of the NCPO's justification for the coup that I think are, are much less interesting but could, be, but could also be productively addressed by someone other, other than me. Um, in particular, I am waiting for someone, for an economist or someone who thinks like an economist to pull apart what they've done with the economy. <laughs> Um, because that was another piece of their explanation, that this kind of chaos is driving away foreign investment. Um, have they actually been able to bring back foreign investment? Like, I'm, I don't claim at all to understand the economic piece of things, so I won't comment on it. Um, but I think it has to be pulled apart. And in the case of the NCPO and other, other regimes that rule in a similar way, part of what's made it so difficult, I think, for for activists, for example, to get any kind of leverage from most foreign governments has been that they say, well, they're respecting the law. They're, they're not, you know, there, there aren't a lot of extrajudicial killings. There aren't a lot of disappearances. They're, they're following the law. So let's figure out how they haven't been. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Very, very great talk. Um, so, in line with the uh, with the previous question, I was wondering what the um, what whether you saw systematic differences in how the military treats the people who cheered the coup initially, and and the people who did not. So, are people who cheered the coup when it happened uh, uh, protected from the types of repression that you described? So, are there are there differences, or is the military just uh, repressing anyone at, with the same mm -hmm. strength? It's a good question. I have a partial answer for it. Um, and I would say watch really closely over the next month and a half. <laughs> One of the intriguing things that's happened as the elections have grown closer is that there have been people who either supported the coup or were on the fence who have come out to, to say, OK, enough already. <laughs> we need to have elections. Um, I don't know how far they can go before they become a problem to the regime. The question of, but there are some other cases that are worth looking into, although they're difficult because they often involve the monarchy. But um, one of those is the example of the arrest of Huta Isla, who was one of the primary leaders of the, um, the PDRC, the People's Democratic Reform Council, that, who's at, I mean, their stated goal in 2013, 2014 was to create the conditions of chaos to cause the military to step in. Um, and Puda Isra in particular had an, um, an armed, and I really mean armed, like automatic weapons armed encampment by the civil service center in Zengwatana um, at the time. He was arrested um, in May. Uh, there was a raid on his temple, and he was arrested and put in prison and accused of, um, of various crimes, including, it seemed, perhaps, perhaps one connected to, uh, to the monarchy. And then he, and he was disrobed, and then he was released, allegedly on, um, on medical grounds. But it's hard to, to take the medical grounds piece of it seriously because there are many gravely ill people in Thai prisons who are not released. Um, so 
how and why he was released is, a, is an open question. Um, it's all to say I don't have enough information to really give you an answer other than to say there are some cases worth, worth looking at and worth paying attention in coming weeks. Okay, so I think we need to wrap up. So, because in addition to giving the talk and in addition to doing our event on journalism tomorrow, uh, Professor Habercorn is also serving as a guest in a class on Southeast Asian politics right now. So she's the <laughs> hardest working person in show business. And she, so we will wrap up a little bit early. Um, but thanks again so much for coming out. Thanks to, to the audience for some great questions. And I uh, hope to see everybody at the journalism event on Southeast Asia tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock. Thanks.